Tonight, we celebrate with great pride the 10th anniversary of the highly coveted Castle Conley National Physician of Year Awards. Over the last 10 years, we have honored 30 outstanding physicians in clinical excellence, 20, uh, 18 remarkable physicians for their lifetime achievement, and 11 extraordinary non-physicians for their outstanding achievement in health care. Our belief is that the very best doctors will lead to the very best health outcomes. And it is our mission at Castle Conley to help people find the, the best health care. Excellence in clinical care is paramount. It results in better outcomes for patients, better health, longer lives, and greater happiness. That's why this event is so meaningful for the Castle Conley organization. It recognizes physicians who are the most excellent, who are making outstanding contributions to healthcare, and who are recognized by their peers as being extraordinary in their clinical skills, care of patients, research, and medical leadership. And I'm pleased to stand here before you all to acknowledge the history, the dedication, the triumphs of this evening's seven amazing honorees. I look forward to hearing their stories and to celebrating their accomplishments, which have helped and continue to help the lives of so many. Once again, thank you so very, very, very much for being with us here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and especially a good evening, in fact, a great evening, to tonight's honorees. As we do in our research process to identify top doctors, we are seeking to recognize physicians who are outstanding, those among the very, very best in the nation. And based on the quality of this evening's honorees, I'm confident we were excess successful in achieving that goal. We strongly believe this group of honorees represents all that we are trying to achieve in selecting physicians for Castle Conley top doctors. Excellence, dedication, a commitment to their profession, to their patients, in fact, to all humanity. It is now my pleasure to present the awards for clinical excellence. Dr. Henry Brim has transformed the field of neurosurgery, leading to breakthrough treatments that have extended the lives of brain cancer patients worldwide. Henry Brim grew up in northern New Jersey, attending the high school at Yeshiva University in Manhattan. He received his undergraduate degree from New York University, his medical degree from Harvard, and trained in neurosurgery at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. He joined the staff at Johns Hopkins in 1984. Dr. Brem changed the surgical treatment of brain tumors by introducing new approaches for targeted therapy. He developed new classes of polymers and microchips for drug delivery that are custom-made for the agent being developed. He then designed and led the clinical trials, demonstrating their safety and efficacy. These were the first new treatments for brain tumors that the FDA had approved in 23 years. Commercially known as Gliadel wafers, his therapy is now used worldwide to intraoperatively deliver chemotherapy directly to the sites of brain tumors. Dr. Brem also carried out the pivotal clinical study that introduced navigational imaging into the neurosurgical suite. His work led to the FDA's approval of the first image guidance computer system for operating on tumors within the brain. As director of the Department of Neurosurgery and Neurosurgeon-in-Chief at Johns Hopkins, he has built one of the largest brain tumor research and treatment centers in the world, training numerous researchers who have revolutionized the fields of intraoperative imaging, angiogenesis, immunotherapy, and controlled-release polymers for drug delivery to the brain. Dr. Brem sees his career in medicine as a moral imperative to provide the best clinical care while pushing research boundaries to enhance patients' outcomes in the field of neurosurgery. His work is in large part responsible for almost doubling the life expectancy and quality of life of brain cancer patients. He foresees a time when brain cancer will no longer be a life-threatening disease, but become a manageable condition. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for Clinical Excellence, Dr. Henry Brim. Dr. Connolly, 
Mr. Castle, ladies and gentlemen, I was very touched when I received the call that, that uh, I was being given an award for clinical excellence. And it made me really think about, you know, how do you define what is clinical excellence? And I would say that it comes from a passion to do what's best for each individual patient who trusts his or her life and well-being to your care. It comes from treating each person the way that you would want yourself or your family to be treated. And it comes from never being satisfied that our current methods of treatment adequately provide the best possible care to our patients. Therefore, we are always striving to do better. For me, that passion is deeply rooted. As a child of two Holocaust survivors from Auschwitz and Buchenwald, I was brought up with a powerful love and constant encouragement that imbued me with a deep devotion to family and an awareness of the tremendous value of education and enlightenment, and also instilled in me a profound desire to make the world a better place. The best part of my life was meeting my extraordinary wife of 37 years, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel herself is regularly listed in the Cass O'Connelly top 1% of cancer doctors. Rachel, who married me when she was 19 years old and has been my love, confidant, and advisor. Together we have a beautiful family with three amazing daughters who are all here tonight, two great son-in-laws, and five extraordinary grandchildren with Eliana representing the uh, oldest of the five. <laughs> I believe that when one appreciates the deep love of family and the desire to protect and preserve those who form your own family, then we truly appreciate what our patients are concerned about and how important it is to deliver care that returns them and their families to a normal life in which they can fulfill their own dreams. In my own journey to strive for this goal for all the patients who trust their care to me, I am indebted, indebted to many people in addition to my own family. First, my inspiring teachers such as Peter Coleman at NYU and Judah Folkman at Harvard, who gave me the tools to answer the big questions about improving patient care, along with the inspiration to do so. Then to my students, who over the years always asked the right questions and worked tirelessly to find new solutions. Then to my colleagues, who have stimulated and enabled me to help so many people, such as Bob Langer at MIT and Judy Wong and Zia Gokaslam from Hopkins Neurosurgery who are here tonight. Our department of 26 neurosurgeons and 10 full-time scientists and 21 residents are indeed my work family and are a daily source of awe and inspiration. I've been fortunate to work under inspire, inspiring and enabling leaders such as the fellow awardee tonight, Mike Johns, with whom I have operated on patients with complex brain tumors and who supported my work when he became the dean at Johns Hopkins. Also, Mike's successors as Dean Ed Miller and Paul Rothman and Health Systems President Ron Peterson and Johns Hopkins University President Ron Daniels. All of them have constantly shared my vision to build a department of surgical scientists and created the environment to make it possible to do so. Perhaps the most inspiring are my patients, who allow me to take care of them with profound trust. They trust not only that I will do my very best, but that I will also do my best to change the way that future patients are treated. Some of those patients become our partners in supporting our work, and some of them are here tonight to celebrate together with me and all of us. I'm grateful to Cass O'Connelly for choosing me for this special honor and for recognizing that we have made progress, a dent, if you will, but a significant one in combating these devastating diseases and fostering the hope that by working together, we will see much more progress in the near future. Thank you.
Dr. Kimberly Brown is a leader in the field of hepatology, developing programs that have dramatically expanded the availability of liver and other organ transplants throughout the Midwest. As lead investigator in scores of research projects, she has done work that has led to pioneering treatments in the battle against hepatitis and other liver diseases. Dr. Brown grew up in a small town in rural Michigan before attending the University of Michigan. She then went on to receive her medical degree at Wayne State University. She completed her residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in gastroenterology at the University of Michigan Medical Center, ultimately serving as chief medical resident. In 1994, she joined Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit as medical director of liver transplantation and later became division chief. As primary investigator in over 30 research trials, she has contributed to major breakthroughs in the treatment of viral hepatitis, advanced liver disease, and post-liver transplant management. When she began her career, hepatitis C was an infectious disease with poor prognosis for its patients. Thanks to her and other investigators' research, hepatitis C became a manageable disease. Today, we are at the cusp of another major advance, a simple all-oral treatment regimen that has been described as the first true cure of the infection. Dr. Brown is also one of the most sought-after teachers in the field. She promotes better medical outcomes through balancing the explosion of new technologies with the careful, compassionate, and hands-on observation and treatment of patients. In addition, she is a popular figure and author on the national health care scene, presenting at conferences and meetings on liver transplantation and viral hepatitis treatments. Furthermore, she is active at Henry Ford in multiple leadership roles, including sitting on the Board of Governors and Board of Trustees, helping to shape the institution's future and inspiring all those around her to excel. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for Clinical Excellence, Dr. Kimberly Brown. Well, before I begin, I'd like to make just one correction. I'm not a transplant surgeon. I am a hepatologist. For all the surgeons in the room, we're the people who do all the work. Okay. <laughs> and I would like to say as I was sitting there, it's about the time you wish that BRO came before BRE because following Dr. Brown is, is a bit challenging. <laughs> But I'd like to uh, start by sharing a story, uh, a patient story, because that's what I do. One of my patients, he came to see me first in 2007. He was 51 at the time. He was a father to a 13-year-old girl and a husband. And like you saw in the video, he had hepatitis C, as most of my patients do. And despite our best efforts at treatment, he developed cirrhosis. Medical therapies at that time were very difficult. Patients uh, couldn't tolerate them well, and viral cures were less than 5% of the patients who could actually take the therapy. So in 2008 and again in 2012, he required a liver transplantation in an attempt to restore him back to health. But following his second liver transplant, the virus became very aggressive, and within eight months, his second liver transplant was failing, and we really had no medical alternatives for him. His daughter was just graduating from high school, and we were really out of options. But there was a medication that we had been studying in clinical trials, termed at that time 7977. And through the work of our nurses and research staff, our patient was finally able to start the drug in early 2013 through a compassionate use program because the drug had not yet been FDA approved. The problem was our patient was dying because although he had received the medication and we could no longer detect his virus, we'd really gotten the medication to him too late. It's very uncommon for patients to receive a third liver transplant, but the team looked at the situation and thought that because he was clear of the virus, perhaps this could be a benefit to him and he would do well. So just a month after starting the new medication, he received yet a third liver transplant. His course was rocky, as you might expect, but he was able to complete the medication. He made a full recovery, and today he's alive, he's cured of hepatitis C, and he enjoys normal liver function and excellent health. <laughs> he 
he gives back. He volunteers for the support group in the Henry Ford Transplant Institute, and he's working toward becoming a pastor. And that 13-year-old daughter is now grown and is working toward becoming a nurse. The medication he received, by the way, was approved nine months after he received his third liver transplant. And he and I both recognize that had it not been for the Compassionate Use Program, he would never have lived to see that day. So who are the heroes of this story? Well, certainly the patient, his family, the donor families, for trusting all of us to have the knowledge and expertise to define a strategy to help him overcome illness. Certainly the nurses, physicians, administrative and research staff, for the constant care, communication, support, and expertise they provided him throughout his entire journey. Certainly the scientists who discovered and characterized hepatitis C, as well as those who pioneered the early development of direct therapies against the virus. And certainly the pharmaceutical company for not only developing the medication which saved his life, but for having the courage to allow him access to the medication before FDA approval. Medicine is really a team sport. And although physicians may at times be the coach or the quarterback, it takes the entire team to execute excellence. I work with over 1,200 outstanding physicians who make up the Henry Ford Medical Group. And each day I come to work, I am blessed with the opportunity to care for individuals who come seeking access to the amazing medical advances I and all of you have seen throughout our careers. I practice through a time where the limited options that I could once offer patients have really developed now into cures for many of their diseases. Through clinical trials and transplantation, we've been able to help patients gain access to life-saving treatments and restore both function and health to individuals with liver disease. To return a father to his family or a mother to her husband and children is nothing short of a miracle. What an amazing time it is that we live and practice medicine in. My only regret is my life will be too short to appreciate all that I think is, a, is to come. I want to thank Castle Connolly for this recognition. It has been an honor over the years to be included in their listing of physicians. I want to thank my children and my family. My sister-in-law is here tonight. She came from Detroit for the constant support they've given me over my career, and especially to my husband, Tony. He was such a great dad that my three children barely knew I was always at the hospital. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank my patients for granting me the privilege every day of hearing their stories and inspiring me to do my very best. Thank you. Dr. Fabrizio Michelosi is internationally recognized as an outstanding clinician, researcher, and teacher whose vision and leadership is setting new standard for academic university medical departments. Dr. Michelosi was born and grew up in Pisa, Italy. His grandfather was a doctor, and as a boy, he accompanied him on house calls, inspiring him to become a doctor in his own right. After graduating summa cum laude from the University of Pisa School of Medicine, he completed his internship and general surgery residency at New York University. After completing a research fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital, he joined the faculty of the Department of Surgery at the University of Chicago in 1984, serving as vice chair of and the Thomas D. Jones Professor of Surgery. In 2004, he moved to New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center to assume the chairmanship of the Department of Surgery. Under his leadership, and with continuous support from the hospital and medical college leadership, the department has undergone an unprecedented period of growth and transformation, adding important new clinical programs and strengthening both the educational curriculum and the research initiatives. As a surgeon, he has developed an international reputation in the surgical treatment of gastrointestinal and pancreatic cancers, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. He has pioneered a novel bowel-sparing procedure for advanced Crohn's disease, the Michelosi strictureplasty, which has significantly improved the quality of life for these patients worldwide. A prolific author and teacher, Dr. Michelosi has been an active member in more than 50 professional societies, has served as president of seven of them, and he is currently the chair of the Board of Governors of the American College of Surgeons. 
Despite his many responsibilities, Dr. Michalasi continues his work integrating clinical, educational, and research into a dynamic, unified vision of patient care. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for Clinical Excellence, Dr. Fabrizio Michalasi. Thank you, Dr. Connolly, <clears throat> and thank you, Mr. Castle, for conferring this honor on me. I'm truly humbled, I'm truly grateful. It is amazing to me <clears throat> that someone could receive an award like this just for doing something that has been such a joy, such a pleasure, a construct of life, a fabric of life, just taking care of patients in a professional and compassionate way. I would be remiss if I were not to thank the individuals who have nominated me. Dr. Wayne Isom, here in attendance today, a former teacher of mine, <clears throat> and Drs. Armando Giuliano and Michael Zinner, who could not be here with, me to, with us tonight. All three of, the, of them have been previous recipients of this award. Already alluded in the introductory movie is the fact that my uh, grandfather had a great influence on me. <clears throat> Born in 1891, he graduated from medical school just in time to be sent to the Austro-Italian front during World War I. And the atrocity of uh, a trench war were his introduction to the practice of medicine. He saw young men dying of trauma, gangrene, hypothermia. He told me many times that he felt helpless and impotent in caring for them. Yet because of his compassion and caring, he was beloved by the battalion to which he was assigned. Upon returning from the war, he sat uh, down in a village nearby Pisa and became uh, a uh, a general practitioner, he inspired me to pursue a career in medicine and showed me the healing power of empathy. Two additional figures had great influence on me during medical school in Italy. Uh, Professor Mario Selli, he was the uh, chairman of surgery at the University of Pisa, and his successor and my good friend, Professor Franco Mosca. Professor Selly inspired me uh, by showing me over and over again the sublime beauty of a perfectly performed surgical procedure. I'm sorry, Dr. Brown. <laughs> <laughs> and the sublime beauty of a bloodless surgical procedure done with utmost respect for the anatomical planes. Franco Mosca, his successor and then chair of surgery in the same university, inspired me with this incessant search for improvement and progress. It was my good fortune to come to the States for my residency training, and I was indeed blessed by many more mentors. I would like to recognize uh, three. Uh, Dr. Frank Spencer, chairman of surgery at NYU, for showing to us residents the importance of quality improvement through analysis of outcomes well before this was a common concept. Dr. John Ranson, attending surgeon at NYU for stressing the importance of evidence-based medicine. And Dr. George Block, attending surgeon at the University of Chicago for teaching me how to earn the confidence and trust of a patient without which the sacred patient-physician bond on which a surgical intervention is based cannot exist. But this would have not been enough. <clears throat> I had some significant help along the way in the form of uh, great support staff, secretaries, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, patient coordinators, and a wonderful patient services team. Some of them are here tonight. Thank you for your loyalty, skills, and exceptional abilities. I also want to thank uh, the uh, close to 300 or so surgical chief residents and fellows with whom I've worked very closely over the past 30 years. This is a special breed of committed, indefatigable physicians 
who have helped me carry out my mission as surgeon and physician. A special thank to my colleagues in the Department of Surgery, some of whom are here tonight, for their support, hard work, and help in making our department the success that it has become. And like the two previous uh, awardees, a thank to all my patients who have allowed me to operate on them and uh, trust in them to uh, my care. Honestly, all this is made much easier by practicing in a first-class institution, New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center, where patients really come first. Dr. Stephen Corwin, who is here tonight, along with the uh, leadership uh, team of the New York Presbyterian Hospital, and Dr. Lori Glimcher, the dean of Wild, Medical, uh, or Wild Cornell Medical College, share their leadership and vision in creating an environment conducive to and facilitating of excellent clinical care. The help and guidance of their trustees and overseers makes uh, all this so much more meaningful. I would like to especially thank Mr. Alberto Cribiore, James Kills, and Michael Tuziani here with us tonight for their exceptional help uh, to me personally and uh, to the Department of Surgery. Last but not least, my wife, Dr. Karen Heller, a physician as well, who has been a constant guide in a culture which was, uh, for me, uh, foreign 38 years ago when I came to the States. With her inspiring and inspired guidance, she has transformed me from a stranger in a foreign land into a completely integrated individual. Without her devoted guidance, constant support, and precious advice, I would not stand here today in front of you. Thank you, Karen. Dr. Michael Johns is a visionary who has influenced and shaped the roles of hospitals, medical education, and public health policy. Raised in a working class family in Detroit, he attended a Catholic seminary high school before studying biology and chemistry at Wayne State University. He studied medicine at the University of Michigan, where he did both his internship and residency in otolaryngology. After a stint as assistant chief of otolaryngology at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center, he joined the faculty at University of Virginia Medical Center. In 1984, Dr. Johns was recruited to Johns Hopkins as professor and chair of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery. While building the department into one of the country's largest and most prestigious, he developed an international reputation as a head and neck oncologist, creating innovative approaches to voice reconstruction after laryngectomy. In addition, he was one of the first to evaluate the role of stem cells in squamous cell cancers of the head and neck. As associate dean, he reorganized the faculty clinical practice and initiated Johns Hopkins' first outpatient center. During his term as medical school dean and vice president of the medical faculty, he developed innovative technology transfer programs, helped elevate the school into first place in sponsored research, and reformed the curriculum so that it would be more relevant to the practice of medicine in the 21st century. Under his tenure, Johns Hopkins Hospital consistently ranked number one in the nation by U.S. News and World Report. In 1996, Dr. Johns became Executive Vice President for Health Affairs at Emory University. There, he positioned the Woodruff Health Sciences Center to be one of the nation's preeminent academic health centers by creating the leading healthcare system in Georgia and recruiting and retaining leading researchers and clinical investigators from around the world. Dr. Johns is widely known as a catalyst of new thinking in many areas of health policy and education, which is why he is asked to serve on diverse boards and committees and to work with state and federal policymakers on topics ranging from training future physicians to national health system reform. In June 2014, Dr. Johns returned to Michigan to serve as the Interim Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs at the University of Michigan. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for Lifetime Achievement, Dr. Michael Johns. First, I want to thank uh, Jordan Josephson, a former fellow of uh, ours at Johns Hopkins, for nominating me for this award, award, and for David Kennedy, who joined him, being here today. I also want to recognize my noisy colleagues from... <laughs> 
Does they, they know who they are. <laughs> from AMN Healthcare, who have traveled from San Diego to be here uh, for this special recognition. Thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Of course, I want to especially recognize my wife, Trina, who is with me. Uh, she's been my guiding partner in my life for just about 50 years, just a few more months. Um, yeah, thank you. She was 18, I was 18, she was 15, and she tells all of our friends, you don't ever want to do that. <laughs> well, I'm honored to be here to receive this award. It is a, a little jarring, though, to get a Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> you know, when your life is still going. I mean, it's a... Uh, <laughs> I, I even feel like, you know, I have some work left to do and, and contributions yet to make, but anyhow. <laughs> but I, I will take the suggestion, because I think it's a good suggestion to slow down a little bit. After all, Trina's told me to get a life for many years. <laughs> And maybe it's time to follow her advice and, and get one. Um, well, so those of you uh, who've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, and I'm kind of a fan of reading his books, reading his books, they're full of anecdotes, uh, stories that, that really have a meaning. You might recall in Outliers his uh, anecdote that he shares about a man named Christopher Langan. Despite having a genius IQ of 195, Langan spent his life working and eventually running a horse farm in rural Missouri. He did not become a scientist, an engineer, or a millionaire. He didn't cure cancer. He didn't invent the internet or establish a foundation to fight for social justice. Nothing in Langan's life helped him make the most of his remarkable intelligence. As Gladwell writes, and I quote, he had to make his way alone, and no one, not rock stars, not professional athletes, not software billionaires, and not even geniuses, ever make it alone. Well, I'm not Mick Jagger, Derek Jeter, or Bill Gates. I'm also not Christopher Langan. I've been fortunate to build a successful life, and I would never have done so. I would not be here in front of you today if not for the people who shaped me along the way. The most influential people in my life by far were my parents. I grew up in Detroit in a family of modest means. My parents' formal education ended with high school. But despite this, they never let me or my four siblings forget the power and importance of higher education. My parents also taught us that hard work is the norm and not the exception. You always have to work harder, harder to make a difference. You should always strive to do better and to be better. Oh, and they had rules too. Of course, you follow the rules or else. You kind of felt it sometimes. <laughs> the important thing also when there are rules is you, sometimes you learn workarounds. That has served me very well. Now, in addition to a wonderful family, I've been blessed with many great mentors and preceptors as well. Too many to begin to tick off and mention each and every one of them. These folks taught me the fundamental value of asking why and how to find answers through research. Not that asking why has helped me out always, however, but I do love the question why. So let me tell you a story where it didn't help me so well. I didn't know it at the time. In my third year of medical school, I was on my surgical clerkship. And those physicians in the room, uh, particularly back at the era that I was doing those kind of clerkships, can recall this. I personally wasn't interested in surgery at all at the time. Now I am one, or are one, or was one. But I worked really hard, night and day. And you remember those days. There were no 80 hours. I loved, I really loved and still love the idea of caring for patients. And I loved to ask questions. So at the end of the surgical rotation, I took the final exam and I got my A. But then I got my final grade. And it was a B. Amazed and sorry, I went to see the professor. And of course, I asked my favorite question. Why? 
Well, he shuffled through his files. He found them, pulled it out, looked it over, and said, oh, it's simple. The chief resident said, you ask too many questions. <laughs> and he gave you a B. Well, you can't win them all. And thankfully, that didn't deter me from continuing to ask, why? Why? Well, you can't uh, continue with life, but I did. Asking why also is what pushed me over from my academic side to the dark side. <laughs> yes, I became an administrator, one of them. <laughs> I was asking why. Why about leadership? Why about strategy, the strategy? Why about healthcare? What was the ecosystem like? Why are we doing this? And this annoyed some people. But sometimes I found you need to annoy people to make them uncomfortable and make them ask, why? That's how change happens, how people and systems evolve. Like Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. You can't discover the new with ask, without asking a whole lot of whys. In closing, I do want to thank my chief advisor and my partner, my CAO, that's the chief advisor officer. <clears throat> you may have one of yourself. Uh, she's my partner in all things, uh, Trina. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, this is one lifetime achievement award that we uh, both won. We got here together. I'll leave you with a, a little quote from uh, Robert W. Woodruff. He was the CEO of Coca-Cola from 23 to 54. It's a pretty long run, given the average today is three. And the namesake, he's the namesake of Emory's Health Sciences Center, known as the Woodruff Health Sciences Center. He said, and I quote, it's easy to see down into the valley and up the next slope, but it's tough to see over the next hill. But that's our job. In my experience, sometimes the view from those hills is the best view of all. And the most important thing any of us can do in our careers is to realize that our greatest contribution is in helping others to keep the winds of change blowing, to make sure that we help the Christopher Langans of the world realize their remarkable potential. So I want to say congratulations to all here who have accomplished so much, and so many of you in the audience as well. I do want to always mention my good friend Henry, the good old days when we actually were in the OR together, caring for patients and making a difference. I'll never forget those times and days. Uh, that's one of those big things you do when you move from that really good side to that dark side of administration and eventually you become a full-time administrator and I can tell you that the one thing you really miss is making a difference for people that you can do one-on-one -on -one with them. Uh, in the clinical care world. And it's a remarkable thing about what top doctors and great doctors do every day. And that is making a difference for the people around them. That's what we do and what we're about. Thank you all very much for this award. Dr. John Mulliken is a leading pediatric plastic surgeon whose work on the advancement of techniques and understanding of cleft lip and palate repair, craniofacial reconstruction, and vascular anomalies has impacted the lives of children worldwide. Born and bred in America's Midwest, he attended Princeton University, graduating magna cum laude. He earned his medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons and completed general surgical residency at Massachusetts General Hospital. He served two years in the U.S. Army as commander of the 43rd MASH unit in Korea. He later trained in plastic surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital before returning to New England at Boston's Children's Hospital. Dr. Mulliken pioneered the field of vascular anomalies, authoring a landmark paper on cellular differences. It is the most cited article in plastic surgical literature and the basis for the field's widely accepted classification system. He also co-wrote the core textbook in the field and is the co-founder of the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies. Dr. Mulliken is recognized for developing and refining techniques for the repair of unilateral and bilateral cleft lip. 
His surgical and masterful expertise in the correction of birth defects is widely sought by families throughout the world. Highly regarded as an influential teacher, Dr. Mulliken is known for cultivating a sense of wonder in students, residents, and fellows at Harvard Medical School. His devotion to his patients, commitment to the highest standards of excellence, and continual self-improvement has inspired countless trainees, scholars, and visiting surgeons. Currently, he is professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, director of the Craniofacial Center, and co-director of the Vascular Anomaly Center at Boston Children's Hospital. Deeply committed to providing personal care, Dr. Mulliken still works a full clinical schedule, seeing patients six days a week, and publishing in surgical and scientific journals. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for Lifetime Achievement, Dr. John Mulliken. As my mentor, Dr. Judah Folkman, often said, after that introduction, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> I thank Dr. Adam Coker for submitting my name to Castle Connolly, to Mr. John Castle, and Dr. John Connolly for saving my place when I could not attend last year. Thanks Stuart Diamond for that, producing that video. I don't know where it came from. Thanks to, to Dr. Jean Morgan for the biographical sketch. And I'm delighted this evening to, sh to share this, this time with my, with two classmates, with, with one classmate from PNS, Larry Rappaport and his wife, Karen, and two colleagues from PNS, Dr. Maria Garzon and Dr. Jun Wu. Also want to thank Ms. Marley Warman, who I haven't seen since she was about five years old, who is the daughter of one of my colleagues. And she's taking care of my daughter tonight to try to keep her uh, simulated by her iPhone. We just, had a, we just had a diaper emergency, that's why she had to step out. <clears throat> also, of course, have to thank my mentors, Dr. Judah Folkman, father of angiogenesis, Dr. Paul Tessier, father of craniofacial surgery, and Dr. Joseph Murray, father of kidney transplant, uh, solid organ transplantation, and Nobel laureate in 1990. With tissues such as this, Anyone with a modicum of intelligence and ambition couldn't help but succeed. I didn't know much about this award and how it was arrived at until tonight. Nevertheless, it has a greater reach than I had never ever appreciated. Two weeks ago, I received phone calls and messages from classmates and colleagues across the country congratulating me upon seeing my photograph in the New York Times. Allow me a minute to reflect on what I've learned at this juncture in my life. Howard Thurman, an African-American theologian and civil rights activist, said there are only two questions in the adult life to be answered. The first is, where am I going? And the second is, who will go with me? And if you get these questions in the wrong order, you will be in trouble. I've always been passionate about my work but I couldn't find that special someone to go with me, so I just kept going and kept going and going. I married for the first time seven years ago at the age of three score and 10. <laughs> Is that you clapping because you could calculate what that meant? <laughs> we married a few blocks away at St. Patrick's. Now I'm the first time father of a four-year-old daughter named Olivia was here tonight. My bliss is fully credited to the love of my life and Olivia's mother, Dr. Portia Chu, also a plastic surgeon. Portia, would you stand for us, please? <clears throat> I'm in a stage when my colleagues are retiring and enjoying weekend play with their grandchildren. I continue to work full time, but do my best to return home to early as I can to read a bedtime story to Olivia. As I watch her sleeping, all the papers I've written are only minor monuments to immortality. They seem to shrink into insignificance. Nothing I could ever create would equal this extraordinary new life. I admit it's difficult to get up from the floor after playing tea party with Olivia. <laughs> Some of you know what I mean. 
I, I can tell you about some special physical therapy you can do to work on that. <laughs> Being a late in life father has altered the way I think about my little patients. I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I wanted, I, I wanted to tell you, I, I admit it's difficult to getting up from playing with Olivia. But as Joseph Campbell, American mythologist, observed, I don't feel like an old man. I just feel like a young man. There was something wrong with him. <laughs> Being a late in life father has altered the way I think about my little patients. I've always practiced the golden rule of pediatrics. Treat the child as if he or she were your own. And I've always felt sympathy for parents of a sick child. But now as a parent myself, I feel a deeper sense of empathy, particularly if the child has a facial birth defect. Thank you again, Castle Connolly, for this incredible honor. In the course of a few months, the Anthony Sinertia Jr. ALS Charitable Foundation has gone from a small local foundation promoting awareness and helping families with ALS to becoming the touchstone for one of the most recognized and effective charitable social media phenomena. Twelve years ago, Anthony and Jeanette Sinertia, high school sweethearts, were in love and starting out a new life together in their hometown of Pelham, New York. Though Anthony had some symptoms of muscle weakness, it wasn't until several months later they were given the devastating news that he had ALS. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, often referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. The progressive degeneration of motor neurons damages the brain's ability to initiate and control muscle movement. With voluntary muscle action progressively affected, patients in the later stages of the disease often become totally paralyzed. Despite the diagnosis, Anthony and Jeanette remained determined to create a beautiful life together, including raising a family of their own. To help raise awareness and to support other local families dealing with ALS, the Synergias and Friends arranged an annual softball tournament and other events. In early 2014, Anthony and Jeanette decided to expand their charitable work by forming a small foundation. Then in July, just as their nonprofit status was about to be granted, Jeanette was approached by her cousin's husband to do an ice bucket challenge with the option to donate to the ALS Foundation. Though the ice bucket challenge was originally meant to allow participants to donate to any charity, something remarkable happened right after Jeanette's video went online it immediately spread through her town of Pelham, New York, then to other people in the ALS community. Within a few days, 1,000 people had seen the video and taken the challenge. Within weeks, thousands more were participating. Suddenly, the ice bucket challenge became associated with the search for a cure for ALS. It became a national, then global phenomenon. What began as a simple gesture of goodwill became one of the most successful fundraising campaigns in history. To date, it is estimated that well over $100 million has been donated to ALS charities throughout the world. Though the Ice Bucket Challenge phenomenon has receded for the moment, Anthony and Jeanette continue their own charitable work. Their foundation has been helping other ALS families who have been struggling financially. They also believe in supporting their own community and demonstrate how simple acts of compassion, love, and humor can change the world, and to one day help find a cure for one of our most challenging health problems. The 2015 National Physician of the Year Award for National Health Leadership, Anthony and Jeanette Sinergia. Jeanette and I would like to thank John Castle and Dr. John Connolly and the entire Castle Connolly team for recognizing our charitable foundation here tonight. We stand in front of you humbled and incredibly honored. We would also like to thank Doreen Gordon, President and CEO of the Greater New York ALS Chapter, and Dr. Hiroshi Mitsumoto, Head of Columbia Presbyterian's ALS Research Center for being with us tonight. Doreen has not only been an instrumental part of our journey, but an incredible leader for us and the entire ALS community for a long time. I have been seeing Dr. Mitsumoto and his team for 12 years, and every day I am inspired by a man who has dedicated his life to finding a cure for ALS. I would sincerely like to thank you both. On May 17, 2003, I married my high school sweetheart. 
I was 32 and Jeanette was 30. It was just two months later on July 23rd that I was diagnosed with ALS and told that I had only two to five years to live. I remember every detail of that morning. I went outside and on the corner of 168th and Fort Washington, I bought a small cup of coffee with no sugar and a glazed bow tie donut. As I sat on the wall, I wondered how I was going to tell my parents, my three brothers, my friends, and most importantly, my new wife. I told everyone that night that I would not be the average two to five years. And to please do not let this consume them because I was going to refuse to let it consume me. I was determined to just live my normal life. I remember telling Jeanette that there are many people worse off than us and that everyone will endure obstacles in our life. ALS was ours and it's how we handle those obstacles and move forward in a positive way that will ultimately define who we are. After two years, my brother Joe and my friend Danny approached me about doing an ALS charity softball tournament. At first, I was reluctant because I'm a pretty private guy, but I agreed only on the conditions that all the donations would be directly donated to Columbia University ALS Gift Fund. And now nine years later, we have donated over $130,000, our small contribution to help fight ALS. Uh, March 6, 2008, Jeanette and I were blessed by the birth of our daughter, my angel, Taya Rose. It was when Taya was entering school and started having play dates that I found myself hiding in other rooms because I didn't want them I was asking her, why does your dad talk funny? But this wasn't fair to her, because to her, I was just her normal dad. It was at this time we thought that by creating a foundation, we would not only generate awareness, but would also educate both children and adults about ALS in our community. Jeanette and I are fortunate to have an incredible family and friends, so our charity was to help families less fortunate. We wanted Taya to learn that it's not what we take from life, but rather what we give back to others that's important. During the height of the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge, uh, Tay and her friend decided to set up a lemonade stand. And when they were done, they donated their $42 to ALS. It was an amazing and incredible proud moment for us as parents. This is why last month when we were invited to Facebook to review data, I was asked the question, what would you say if a man in a bar said the ALS by Ice Bucket Challenge was bull. My response would simply be, do you have children? Because those of you that do know that as parents, we would do anything in our power to protect and guide our children through difficult times and to teach them about love, compassion for others. While we were extremely happy and proud that the ALS Association received an unprecedented amount of donations, for us it was the awareness that was most important. It's about the comfort I now have communicating with my daughter's friends using my eye gaze machine instead of hiding. And most importantly, it's about the valuable life lessons it has taught our daughter, Taya. We are proud to announce through our foundation, we have continued our annual donations to Columbia University for ALS research, along with helping families who are in financial crisis due to this costly disease. We are proud to be at the forefront of this incredible movement but it is more than that. It has showed the good that in all of us, how everyone from around the world came together one hot summer, whether young or old, rich or poor, famous or not, to support ALS. That's what we are proud of. Thank you.